the consultant to the Office of the State Superintendent for Education to bring you this five part series of our LGBTQ back to basics. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on policy, which is definitely my favorite topic when it comes to, oh, just about everything. Um, I've got a master's in public policy and it's, it's sort of what keeps me up um, and going. So we're going to talk about rights and responsibilities and LGBTQ plus school policy review. Like Nigel said, we're going to pause a few times during the session to to lift up any questions that come up, but I don't want you to wait for them to bring up your questions. We've got the chat. Drop your questions into the chat. There's so many ways to participate over the next hour. You can think about things in your head. You can write them down on a piece of paper. You can drop them into the chat. And in our moments when we have to pause and sort of push questions out back and forth, that'll be an opportunity to even come off of mute and share your questions or your feedback or your comments um, with everyone. A little bit now about me, uh, like I said, Deanna Bruce, I uh, have worked at the intersection of health and education equity for more than 25 years, recognized as a national expert on lots of things, including transgender accommodations and LGBTQ work in schools. I'm frequently called upon by schools and organizations to advise and coach and train school staff on all sorts of school health issues. I've spent much of the past three years in private practice almost four or five years in private practice, but much of the past three years has been spent really supporting the DC public charter schools on all of their COVID mitigation strategies and immunization uh, compliance strategies. But before that, I served as director of health and wellness for DC public schools for about a decade or so, where I developed and implemented all of our LGBTQ policies and programming. So we'll go ahead and get started with some group agreements. These are uh, things if we were in the in in a room together, I would ask for some thumbs ups. I know we've got a virtual option to do thumbs up with some emojis, but we're, these are the things that I'm going to ask for us. So we've reviewed. I'll review what we've said in previous sessions. Let's be present. It's after school. You could be driving home. You could be at the grocery store. You could be picking up your kids. Instead, you're here with with me and with us. So be present so let's maximize this time that we're prioritizing together. Provide grace and space for yourself and others. Uh, when we're thinking about LGBTQ issues, it's, some of it can be really hard hitting. For those of you all who were at our mental health and data training, uh, the session before this, it was really hard work. It was a, it was hard to think about all the material and the content that we were covering. So I don't want to minimize that. So definitely have grace and space for yourself and also for those other people who are in the training. Practice active listening. You all are doing a great job on that. Uh, really sort of taking in what you're hearing, reflecting, considering and pro providing feedback on all of that when we have moments to chat. Ensure full confidentiality. You know, this is this is this is a conversation that we want to we want to be able to use it to learn and grow together. And so, if you hear something that somebody else says, like you can say, like, "Oh, this is what I heard in the training," but not, "Hey, this is what the, my colleague so and so said in the training." So it's important to make sure that we protect confidentiality and ask. And I've said that already before. Like there are lots of ways to participate. Make sure that you ask because that's how we all learn. We've got a session evaluation at the end of this session. It's really important that you stick around for that evaluation. There are two things that I can that you can do for me so that I can issue you a certificate of completion. One, be here, which you all are already doing, and two, complete the session evaluation. And so with both of those two things completed, you get your exit ticket in the in an email. You're gonna have a session evalu um a certificate of completion waiting for you in a couple of days when we when we finish processing it. So today we're going to cover four things that I want you to learn. And so at by the end of today, I want you to be able to differentiate between bullying, discrimination, and harassment. Those are different things. They mean slightly different things. Uh, sometimes we conflate them. Let's sort of like tease them out and see how they interact with each other. 
let's I want you to be able to analyze federal and district laws that, and policies that guarantee LGBTQ plus rights in schools. I want you to be able to discuss the school's role in preventing LGBTQ plus bullying, harassment and discrimination and the responsibilities of individual educators to include LGBTQ issues in the classroom, in the curriculum, in your classroom, throughout the school uh, in implementing policies. Just, I want you to be able to describe school level changes that advance the implementation, school level changes that can advance the implementation of the rights and policies. So how are we gonna get there? We're going to talk about bullying, harassment, and discrimination. We're going to talk about federal and district laws that support LGBTQ young people. We're going to talk about school policies, what school policies should look like in order to support LGBTQ young people. We're going to talk about privacy, support, and advocacy, and, and then we're going to close out with our session evaluation, like I mentioned. So before we get started, I want you to think about policies. When you think about policy, which you may not dream policies the way I do, but when you think about policies that support you as an educator, that support you at school, school at your place of work, what comes to mind? What are some policies that support you? And then let's think about what is a particular policy in your school that can support LGBTQ students? And so again, you've got opportunities, drop them into the chat, take yourself off mute and just go ahead and share and offer up. And you can also just write them down on your notepad or think about them in your head. A policy at school that benefits you and your identity, right? That protects you and your identity. One of your many identities or multiple identities that you carry. I'll share policy that helped me when I was a new parent. I was, um, um, I needed to pump when I was at work. I was breastfeeding at home and I needed to be able to pump at work. And I had an office at that time with a door and I was able, it was policy, it was office policy that if you needed to pump, you could and you would be guaranteed privacy in order to do that. And you wouldn't have to do you wouldn't have to pump in the bathroom where a lot of women have historically pumped. They'll go into a bathroom stall and sit there and pump. And it was our policy that we would provide a private space for you that was not the bathroom so that you could uh, pump uh, uh, with dignity. So that was a policy at work that protected me as, um, as a new parent. Sexual harassment policy, right, that's another. Thank you uh, for offering that up. Sexual harassment is a policy that benefits us as employees. And we can also think about policies at your school, like sexual harassment, that can also support LGBTQ plus students. Yeah, and I'll just elevate um, a, a great policy is is uh, the accessibility and the availability of a gender neutral restroom. Right, exactly. So a school policy where they will make a gender neutral restroom available to uh, to students and staff. Uh, and we also see that there's a bullying bullying po prevention policy uh, lifted up in the chat, which also is a great policy for protecting LGBTQ students among other students. All right, this is great. Thank you all for some of that. Let's go ahead and keep moving. So here's a whole bunch of words on the screen. That's really definitions of bullying, harassment and discrimination. And so. We're going to talk a little bit about the difference and then in a couple a couple of moments we're going to really kind of break out the difference between bullying and harassment and so i'm going to start at the bottom with discrimination discrimination is when you treat someone differently 
or a group differently as compared to other people or other groups. And so harassment can be a form of discrimination. Bullying can be a form of discrimination. But that is when you're treating a group of people differently than you treat other groups. And so when I think about schools, uh, what comes to mind for me, I was working with a school several years ago, and uh, the the school was telling me that, or someone in the school, a staff member in the school was telling me that they there was a consequence for kissing in the hallway. It was a high school, and if the kids were caught kissing in the hallway, they would be sent to the office. There would be an office referral for them. But it was only when lesbian, gay, bisexual questioning kids were actually kissing somebody of the same gender. So if a boy was kissing a boy or a girl was kissing a girl in the hallway, they would get sent to the office. But the school was not penalizing or consequencing students who were kissing in the hallway of opposite genders. So if a boy and girl pass each other in the hallway and kissed each other, that was not um, an office referral. And so that's a form of discrimination where you're treating one group of people differently than the other in your policies. And then we can get up to, um, I'm gonna go jump to the top for bullying and bullying is that that unwanted behavior. It can be repeated or have the, the potential to be repeated over time. There's an, a real or perceived power imbalance. It's aggressive. Uh, and that is sort of what we think about when we think about bullying behavior. And that's a little bit different. It's there's there's bullying behavior that you can um, you know, it is it is a little bit less intense than harassment in many ways, but it's unwanted, it's aggressive, it's based on real perceived power imbalance. And so an example of bullying could be where, um, my mom tell, told the story when she was little, she had long braids and uh, the kid who sat behind her, they had ink wells, the, the, their, their desks had ink wells. And so there was a hole. If some of you remember when we were little, our desks still may have been so old that they still had holes in them. There was a hole at the top of the desk. Well, when she was in, in school in the 40s and 50s, that hole had an ink well in it that you would dip your pen in to write. And this boy behind her, they were they were in they were alphabetized in this way. He did this to her for years and years and years. He would dip her her braids into the ink well, so her her hair would get full of ink. Um, now, could that have been because she had braids and boys didn't have braids? Yeah, but it wasn't really based on her a particular class or category that she was. It was mostly because she was in front of him and he could. Uh, and so that was definitely a clear sign of bullying behavior that she experienced. And then in the middle, we've got harassment. Sometimes people call it discriminatory harassment. And so that's about unwelcome conduct that's based on a protected class. So we think about sexual harassment where people are, are harassed based on their gender and things like that. And so we've got, you know, when we think about harassment in our schools, it includes when we are harassing someone based on their sexual orientation, when we're harassing them based on their gender identity, when they're harassing them based on their gender expression. It can be severe, pervasive, persistent, and ultimately it's creating a hostile environment. And I'll give you an example for that. When several years ago I was working with a school and there was a non-binary student, so a transgender student who didn't identify on, as a binary gender, they identified as non-binary, and they would uh, try to access an all gender bathroom that was kind of in the hallway on the way to the teacher's lounge. And there was one teacher in particular who would always try to stand in their way and stop them from using the bathroom. The student was able to use the bathroom. The school was clear, you can use that bathroom. But yet this one teacher continued to try to block the student's access to the all gender bathroom. That could have been seen as a very, you know, as a clear example of discriminatory harassment. They were, they were stopping a non-binary student from using an all gender bathroom repeatedly over and over again, creating a hostile environment because they made it very difficult for the, for the student to, to use the bathroom. Um, in fact, it was impossible. What the student ended up doing was that they would sneak out of class during, they would, they would get excused during class and they would use a gendered bathroom 
um, so that they could avoid this teacher who was stopping them from actually using the bathroom that they that they needed to use. So now we're going to talk about a little bit about when bullying bleeds into harassment. Uh, so what we have, we don't have a federal law in in the United States that directly addresses bullying, uh, but we do have DC law that requires schools to have bullying prevention policies and it requires schools to follow them, the policies that they enact. There's model policies that were developed for schools and every LEA in DC has a bullying prevention policy that has been approved by the city. Now, bullying is going to overlap with harassment. We kind of talked about on the previous slide where there might be a, where we're talking about legally protected traits and identities. So when it, the bullying is actually, hey, that's so gay, that's so gay, that's so gay, repeatedly told to a kid, that's bullying, but actually it's also discriminatory harassment because it's based on a, that student's real or perceived sexual orientation or perhaps a gender identity, gender expression, something like that. The teacher, the example that I gave you that was blocking the non-binary student from using an all-gender bathroom, that could look like bullying, but it's probably really harassment. Uh, and so it's important for schools, oftentimes I see schools will, will categorize something up bullying when really we're talking about a legally protected identity and trait. And so while we don't have a legal protection to bullying, we have a legal protection from harassment. And so it's important for schools as they're as when we're talking about discipline and and consequences for students that we're really keeping in mind uh, when we're talking about bullying and when we're talking about harassment. And oftentimes that's a conversation with the student like, you know, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble if you continue to harass someone. And when it comes to federal laws and district laws, the schools have a responsibility to interrupt and stop that harassment. So that school had a responsibility to stop that teacher from Kenneth coming anywhere near that student to stop them from using the bathroom. Federally funded schools and all DC schools have an obligation to resolve harassment on these bases. So some here are some more examples. I gave you some some good examples, but let's think about some other examples where bullying behavior might be harassment. So repeatedly misgendering a student. I've had I've worked with some lawyers on some cases where uh, that was one thing that kept happening. And so when the young person grew up and turned 18, they got legal counsel and they sued their school district. And some of the reason was because one of the teachers continued to misgender them. Uh, when I was, you know, going through um, some some of the some of the documents. Another thing is re another example is refusing to use a student's chosen name. So a transgender student tells you. You know, I'm now going by Daniel. Uh, I'd like you to call me Daniel. Re repeatedly refusing to use a student's chosen name can be a form of harassment. I remember working with a school a few years ago where the teacher said, I don't use nicknames. Um, but refusing to use that student's chosen name over and over again can be a form of harassment. Making disparaging remarks about someone's sexual orientation, gender identity, or their gender expression. And so sexual orientation is who you're attracted to. Gender identity is who you understand yourself to be. It lives in your head. It's like, I understand myself to be a girl, a woman. And gender expression is how we show up, how we perform our gender, how we, um, the tone of our voice, the way we wear our hair, maybe nail polish or clothes, things like that can be uh, the way that we express our gender. So making disparaging remarks about those categories can put you in a position of committing, of being, being harassing, of ha exhibiting harassing behavior. Not letting a student wear jewelry or clothing or accessories that are allowable in the dress code, but may differ from say societal norms for gender. I worked with a school where they, um, a student, a, a male student, uh, was prohibited from using nail polish and that actually in DC is not allowed if it's if it's acceptable by the dress code it can't be there can't be different consequences for people who are um, based on gender so that can be a form of discrimination and also harass so it's discrimination to have different standards uh, for different genders when it comes to the dress code and it's harassment when the teacher continues to tell the student to stop wearing nail polish. 
And gender-based harassment can be considered sexual harassment, which I think is important. Sometimes we, we start assigning it to other things, but it actually can be a form of sexual harassment uh, that can be reported to your Title IX coordinator for an investigation. And so when I say things like reported to Title IX coordinator for investigation, like that makes it sound like the policy can be mean and hard, but really these policies are in place to protect all of us uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have a lot of protections based on both district and federal law that we'll talk about in a moment, and those are designed to keep us safe, um, to allow us to show up as our whole selves at work, at school and places like that. So I'm going to pause real quick here and see uh, if we can generate a little conversation. And if you all could share, I've shared with you lots of examples, but think about some of those positive ways in which your school actively prevents bullying and discriminatory harassment. So what are some of those ways? They can be simple ways, uh, but what are some of those ways that your school prevents bullying and harassment? And we're not going to double check to see if, you know, do, is, are they really doing it? But, you know, what are those things? What are the ways in which your school is messaging out how they prevent bullying and harassment at school? And it doesn't have to be a policy. It can be a practice. What's a way in which they prevent this from happening. And you can drop the, your comments into the chat or you can take yourself off mute. Well, um, I don't know if it's, I thought it was helpful because it was something that I hadn't seen at any of the other schools. So, um, on the doors to the classrooms, they will say teacher such and such or miss such and such or Mr. Um, such and such. So I think that's a great way to open up the dialogue that not everybody um, identifies as male or female. So having the teacher, like I can't remember the person, but it was like teacher such and such. As soon as I saw it, I already knew what it was. And I thought that was helpful and creating like a safe space for the kids to kind of follow suit. It is more inclusive. Are you talking about mix, MX, sort of a gender no. neutral term? Or so instead of MX, it's just, this is my title. So teacher Doyle versus Miss Doyle or Mr. Doyle. So mm -hmm. getting away from gender related things in, gen um, in, in general and referring to the kids as children or students. Right, right. So you're removing the gender, you're know, be more inclusive um, when it comes to um, identifying teachers. Mm -hmm. And we've also got uh, behavior text walk the halls during class changes to monitor behavior. So you've got adults, their eyes on students sort of during passing period to uh, ensure positive behavior. And social emotional less social emotional learning lessons uh, absolutely 100% SEL lessons uh, that they go a long way to help build empathy and perspective taking and all those really important things we need to learn self efficacy uh, responsibility advocacy that will help um, to prevent bullying and harassment. Some people use TR for teacher instead of Ms or Mister. And so, how would that be said? Would it be ter or just tr? Um, I was just following up on um, whoever was speaking before and saying like teacher Smith. Um, I personally have friends that are teachers, and they just abbreviate it in that way. And it's the same as how for Miss or Mister, you don't say mi Ms or Mer when you read Mister. You read it as teacher, but um, ah. it's used as the abbreviation. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I've also heard of uh, like I would could be C E Bruce, certified educator Bruce. Uh, I've I've heard of some 
um, teachers identifying themselves as, especially non-binary teachers, identifying themselves as certified educator, Bruce. School personnel list their pronouns on their doors and signature blocks. That's another way to, to model that, right? We're modeling inclusivity and we're also demonstrating, sending cues to our students that we are safe and that we um, perhaps are not gonna tolerate some negative behaviors because we're already signaling that we're inclusive. This is great, y'all. Let's keep going. So what exactly does the law say? We've got federal law, district law that I mentioned. And so federal law, we've got Title IX. That's our flagship uh, discrimination prevention law. And a lot of people think about Title IX when it comes to sports and uh, because it, it, it advances equity and gender equality in sports, but it goes beyond that. It actually affects everything in schools uh, for students and for, for staff. And so in Title IX, it, is, it prevents gender-based discrimination. There are lots of resolution agreements. So you know, when you work in a school district, the, somebody can file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights, they, which is up the, the US uh, Department of Education. They'll investigate your school district and they may see some changes that you have to make and they'll uh, have you enter into a voluntary resolution agreement with them. Your school district will sign this. So we've got lots of examples of those on the internet where school districts have violated the rights of LGBTQ plus students and the Federal Office of Civil Rights has entered into a voluntary resolution agreement where they've directed the school to make certain kinds of policy and, pra and practice changes. Uh, what we saw happen in 2021 was that the federal administration implemented an executive or issued an executive order that's, that guarantees that gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation are specifically included in uh, an interpretation of Title IX. We also have the DC Human Rights Act. So that's local law, uh, and that's our non discrimination law. So beyond Title IX, we've got a non discrimination law in DC. And in 2006, which was 17 years ago, the DC Council unanimously added gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation to our non discrimination law, to the DC Human Rights Act. So it's been actually when, when I, for, around for 17 years, I do a lot of trainings with school staff and they ask me, is this something new that we're implementing? And I'll say, well, actually it's just taking us 17 years to, to actually fully living into the expectations that the city has for us. And we have the DC Youth Bullying Prevention Act, and that prohibits bullying based on traits that include gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. So we've got a lot of protection in DC when it comes to uh, living and, and breathing and coming to school as our authentic selves related to our sexual orientation, our gender identity, and our gender expression. And so how does all of that, all the federal and, and local laws translate into policies at the school level? There are several ways that schools advance policies. There's the non-discrimination policy that every LEA and DC must have in place, and it must include gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. We all have sexual harassment policies in our staff handbook and our family handbook, things like that. So we've got policies that are also required for us to have in place. We have a bullying prevention policy that's also required for us to have in place. And we have behavior and discipline policies that are also required uh, that we have in place. We've got behavior and discipline policies for staff, and then the ones that are required of us are those ones for students. So there's a lot of places where you'll see uh, LGBTQ students and staff protected in the policies that exist at the school level. And then there are a couple of other areas that I want to bring your attention to when it comes to policies that are protective of LGBTQ plus people. One of those is FERPA. We all know and love FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, and that law allow, allows students to correct educational records that are inaccurate, misleading, or violate a student's privacy. So this is where a parent could, and parents have control over educational records before a young person is an adult. 
And so the parent could request that this to the, to, could tell the school, my child's name and gender marker is actually this. And so please make that change. And so schools are using FERPA as the authority to be able to change that record. I've also worked with uh, alums who have uh, changed their name and gender marker and their birth certificate later on after they became an adult and they came back to their school and asked for a new transcript and a new diploma. And they used FERPA as the authority uh, to make those changes for the alum. It's also, we know that FERPA is need to know basis. So this is where we talk about protecting people's privacy. We use FERPA, FERPA requires us to hold student information private and confidential and only share on an ad and a need to know basis. We also have uh, a lot of court cases at the federal level. We have a Supreme Court case, Bostick versus Clayton County, that extended employment protections based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. So you can no longer be sued because you're gay or you're transgender. And that is the court case that the federal government used when it interpreted Title IX to be inclusive of sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. And then there's federal courts all across the country. Many of them I've provided formal, either formal testimony or written friends of the court briefs uh, in support of transgender students who have sued their school district uh, asking for rights uh, that they believe they're entitled to based on federal and state non-discrimination laws, Title IX and other, other non-discrimination laws at the state level. So that's a lot about laws and policies. Uh, I'd love to know what you already knew about. Um, anything that I said that you already knew about that you're like, Deanna, this is just a review for me. I already knew about that law. Um, and then I'd be curious about something that was new to you, uh, either a law or something about a law that was new information to you right now. Nobody's heard of FERPA? Come on, I'm very disappointed in you all. I know you all have heard of FERPA. Yes, I used to work at a university and that was the first thing that we had to make sure that everybody um, got signed. Um, what I did not know is that that was something that was used um, to that was cited so that if alum uh wanted to have their gender marker changed on their transcript um that's that's how it was done i just thought it was something as simple as like if you get married here's the paperwork things have changed mm -hmm. and you keep it moving so i didn't know that that was um something captured within FERPA. yeah no that's interesting because when we um I was working at DC public schools when we changed that policy so that alums could come and change their information. And one of the things we said was like, well, if somebody got married, uh, we would make that change for them. Uh, so we should be able to, and so it's interesting that you meant that you bring up marriage too, because that was also part of our internal conversation. Uh, but we had clear uh, authority through FERPA because it was an educational, it was a discrepancy in the educational record. And because we must protect their privacy um, through both FERPA and district law, um, we needed to give them an opportunity to change the name on their transcripts so that if they are applying for jobs, we are protecting their identity, their transgender identity, or we are allowing them to, to keep their transgender identity private. I hope others have heard of Title IX. I was at a, a memorial recently and there was a woman there who had played with the deceased at Morgan State. They both were on the basketball team at Morgan State in the late 60s. And 
I had a chance to talk to her and I just said like, wow, it must have been an amazing time to be a female athlete. You were, you were an athlete when Title IX went into effect. And she said, oh my gosh, it changed absolutely everything for them like overnight, which was pretty exciting to, to sort of talk to a bit of history. Um, all right, let's keep going. The school's role. So when I'm thinking about, when I'm working with a school, uh, on developing LGBTQ policies, my first step is that I start looking at their employee handbook and their family handbook, and I start reviewing the policies that they have in place. And these are the kinds of things that I'm looking for to make sure that they are, the policies are inclusive and that also that they are doing all that they can under the law to help support LGBTQ students. So first I'm looking for a school climate survey. So it's something that schools can consider adding LGBTQ plus demographic questions into surveys for analysis. And our previous session, we talked a lot about the youth risk behavior survey and all the demographic questions that are included in that survey. We ask about sexual orientation. We ask about gender identity. And those are questions that schools are increasingly asking on different kinds of surveys that they also administer, um, teacher satisfaction surveys, school climate surveys, like you name the surveys, schools are increasingly adding demographic data so that they can say, well, it's interesting, our transgender students experience their teachers like this and, uh, and their non-transgender peers experience their teachers like that. So if you ask the question, you can analyze the data. And Aussie soon is going to release a district-wide uh, school climate survey to ask students about their experiences in school. So this is exciting. We're gonna have something that can be, that will be picked up by every LEA uh, to be able to ask, gather and analyze school climate uh, survey for from their own students. I'm also looking for names and pronouns. We talked a lot about that already, but students have a right to be called by their preferred name, uh, the preferred gender name pronouns at school. It's protected under DC law, federal law, Title IX. Uh, students who and parents and guardians and students who are 18 and up have the right to request that their educational ref, uh, records reflect their gender names and pronouns even after graduation, like we've already discussed. So I'm looking for ways in which uh, the school is clear in their policies that people have a right to use the names and pronouns that work for them, that make sense for them. And then I'm looking at facilities. Uh, sometimes I have so many pictures of myself in, you know, outside of bathrooms in schools. One day I'm gonna write a book about it, but until then I'll just tell you that when I work with schools, I'm looking to make sure that the students who are transgender and non-binary, that they have a right to use the bathroom that matches their gender identity. And sometimes that may look like a student requesting a single user bathroom. And for the most part, the schools in DC all have single user bathrooms. Some schools are so small that their single user bathrooms are over here being used by teachers. And if there's a student who's asking for a single user bathroom, then it's uh, up to the school to figure out how to make that teacher bathroom accessible for the student who needs to have it. Uh, increasingly, I've worked on a lot of educational design plans for schools and those they'll have, um, they'll place, you know, male bathrooms with female bathrooms, and then they'll place a single user bathroom in the middle, or they'll use sort of a row of those water closets. So, you know, the self-contained rooms that are bathrooms, and then in the hallway, there'll be a bunch of sinks for, for folks to use. So I'm looking for, um, ways in which schools are either using what they have or building something new if they have, let's call it money to do that kind of renovation. Uh, not all schools, especially charter schools, just don't have the kind of budget to be able to do that kind of renovation, but I'm still looking for ways in which they are making their bathrooms accessible to students. I'm also looking for dress codes when I'm reviewing policies for schools. This dress codes have to, by law, be gender neutral, but it's also important that dress codes go out of their way to not discriminate against a specific gender identity or gender expression or gender or sexual orientation, and that they don't impose consequences more strictly on 
people who wear clothing that's most typically assigned to or a, a, associated with a particular gender. So what we see, there was a great report a few years ago by the National Women's Law Center that found that we were, uh, DC schools were consequencing girl bodies more than other bodies because their dress code um, sort of prohibited items that were most typically worn by girls. And so that is not necessary. That's not a gender neutral dress code. Uh, so you're, you want to be able to make sure that when you've got, if you've got a list of things that are prohibited, that you're not just listing things that girls wear, because uh, that tends to be who is consequenced. Uh, but then also that you're often, a lot of schools have uniforms. So you're, you just say like students may wear khaki shorts, pants and skirts and leave it at that. And it's important that these, this gender neutral expectation that it, that you follow it and you use it every day and for special occasions. So let's say prom, promotion, graduation, those types of, um, the winter concert, those kinds of, of things when people are expected to wear something different, that you're also making sure that it's gender neutral there. And then uh, I'm also looking for schools, whether it's written down in their policy or if it's part of their practice, that students can have clubs and affinity groups that support students that are LGBTQ+, say a gender and sexualities alliance. Those are allowed to operate uh, at school, as especially um, that, especially if the, if if the students are running that club, there is legal protection that students may run any club that they really want on, on campus. Um, so I'm also looking at gender-based activities when I work with a school. So students have a right to practice, to participate in activities that align with their gender identity. That means that, um, you know, they can't be forced into a specific gender specific activity. Oftentimes we see this in sports where students are uh, transgender students in DC are allowed to participate on sport teams, sports teams that align with their gender, as long as they just have a letter from their parent or guardian. Uh, nothing else is required of them, but then they can participate. And I've worked with a lot of coaches who have had transgender athletes and have uh, work been able to work them onto the team. Uh, and allow them to participate. Another way that I see people like, use gender-based activities, I see it in uh, PE sometimes, uh, sex ed, uh, walking to the cafeteria or even in the cafeteria, and they'll segregate students based on their gender. And that is a form of discrimination that's not, you can't really support that given the laws that we have in the District of Columbia. So it's important to make sure that you're not using arbitrary gender segregation. And then again, with discipline, I gave the example of people kissing earlier. Uh, it is important for you, have, you have an obligation as an employee to interrupt bullying and harassment when you see it. And you must not provide harsher consequences for certain groups as other groups, in particular, thinking about students who are, who, who may be LGBTQ plus. And then I think about uh, confidentiality and privacy is a really big issue. And I see um, in the comments, we have a question about uh, FERPA and what if a student identifies as LGBTQIA, but their parent is not aware or not supportive. And that's a common question that comes up. So really it's information about a student's gender, pronouns and sexual orientation must be maintained as confidential per FERPA, right? It's need to know. And also we go further in district law that you must not disclose that someone is transgender without their permission. Uh, and that, that is where we have this conversation about parents. We really wanna make sure that our parents are actively engaged in school and that they understand that us as a trusted uh, partner in their child's education. And also we have district law that says that uh, if someone's transgender, we can't really disclose it without their permission. Oftentimes, the fact that a student might be saying at school that they're transgender and not saying it at home, it doesn't interrupt with their academics. And so it's really you want to think about that, how, how, whether or not it's uh, interrupting with their academics. If, you know, that it really is something that it takes some young people uh, time before they can tell 
their parents or their family back at home. Uh, so that oftentimes the mental health professional at the school is probably best prepared to help a young person come up with a plan to tell their parents. We also know that some students can be in harm's way if they tell their parents. And so when they say, my parents cannot know, they also need to be able to trust the school that the school is going to trust them to know that it's not safe to tell their parents. And so that is where it's a little bit of a fine line for schools. Uh, and um, specifically regarding FERPA, what we know about FERPA is that parents have access to students' educational records. So if you've got a student who's transgender and their parents don't know yet and they're still working with the school mental health counselor to figure out how to tell their parents or they've been very clear like, I will be in harm's way, if my parents find out, they will kick me out of the house, they will beat me, they will do other things that sometimes parents can do when they find out that, that their student is transgender, or if they find out that they're lesbian, gay, bisexual, or questioning, that you know, we need to believe them. And because anything that's in, that's in the educational record can be handed to the parent due to because of FERPA, you wanna counsel a young person. Like, I understand that you want me to use this name uh, and gender marker for you, is it okay if I put it in our student information system? If I do put it in the student information system, then if your parent asks for a copy of your educational record, that information will also go with them. And some students will say, like, I'll take that risk, go ahead and put it in the SIS. Well, they might not call it an SIS, but they'll say, yeah, go ahead and put it in. And others will say, like, no, 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 don't put it in there. Um, and so then it's up to the school to figure out ways to communicate with each other, like what this kid wants for their name and gender marker based on what the student wants. They may say there are a lot of, you know, mental health providers who will say that a per or a teachers that will say the student wants me to call them this name and gender when I'm working one on one with them. But if I see them in the hallway, I'm not supposed to do that. And so that's your job to sort of, you know, use do that seesaw and protect the child's privacy in public and use the child's name and gender that they ask for in private. Um, it's hard, but that's what we get to do as educators is hard ways to engage students and keep them engaged in their academics. And I also think about when I'm working with schools, like think about how you prepare for substitutes. You know, when you've got a substitute coming in, there is the SIS, they can print that out the class roster there, or they can look at the class roster on, on your computer. But if it's not, if that information is not in the, the, the educational record, you're going to need to leave a note for the print for the substitute to fill them in on information that's not in the student information system. And then also with park if park when they're passing out those those. The booklets, their name, they're saying people's names out loud and they're reading the name that's on there. So if a student students name and gender that's in their system is different than what people know them to be, you're gonna to wanna to protect their privacy and work with your testing coordinator to make sure that you have a way to pass out, to verify the identity of the student and pass out that park booklet without violating their privacy. Uh, again, hard, but you know, that's why you get paid the big bucks to do the hard work of protecting a student's privacy, building their trust and helping them learn. So now we're going to close up with like, how would you create inclusive policies at your school? Uh, and this is some stuff that you you're going to look for what you you're going to research and you're going to review, right? You don't have to create stuff out of whole cloth. You can look at your staff and student policies that you ex that you have. You can look at laws and policies. This slide deck, I'm giving you all of it for you, right? You can look at best practices and resources. There are lots of other. Uh, policies that exist across the country. DCPS has a strong has strong policies. There are all kinds of policies all over this. There's Glisten and the GSA network and gender spectrum and other resources that I've got later on that sort of show you some of those um, model policies. I would encourage you to form a team when you're thinking about creating new policies for your school. And there are some important people to be on that team. Students, if you can, uh, include them in your team. School leaders, those decision makers, it's important for them to be at the table, even though they're busy, try to help them see why it's important to be on the team. The Title IX coordinator is, an, is essential to doing any kind of policy work when it comes to LGBTQ 
uh, students. And I'm also thinking about teacher leads, departmental leads, discipline leads, deans of students. So those are types of folks that I often recommend schools to put on their team. And then, like I said, make a plan, but don't reinvent the wheel. Borrow from other LEAs, use model policies, and then shop your drafts with decision makers. Uh, you don't want to spend all the time and then have the decision maker just shut it down. Uh, and then revise your policy, revise, 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 revise. Uh, and then once you've got a new policy, the key is communication. It is huge. It's a critical component to any policy. A friend of mine asked me once, if a policy is made and falls down in the forest and no one was there to see it, did it actually happen? If we never actually communicate the policy, it's very hard to expect it to be followed. So you want to announce it in, in uh newsletters you want to use student leaders and ambassadors who can communicate it use clubs as messengers they can have like scavenger hunts and other kinds of fun activities to help students connect with policies and understand the the changes you can train educators we're doing some training today you can train your your educators a lot of times schools will bring me back every year to hire to train their new educators after I've trained their staff and engage families. A lot of principals have those breakfasts. So it's like, you know, morning principal breakfast. That's a great way to have an informal conversation. You can do it at PTA meetings. And I talked, I listed off a whole bunch of organizations earlier. Again, don't reinvent the wheel. There are so many examples already in place for you uh, as you think about changing policy in your own school, whether it's one policy or a whole plan. Uh, and then we also have some LEA resources. DCPS has, uh, has a website with a bunch of resources and the Charter School Board also has a website with a lot of resources. So now we're gonna close out this session. I talked again a lot about policies. I talked a lot about change and how you can enact change, ways and some components about how you would look for opportunities to create change at your school. And so I want you to think about the easiest change you can make. It's really hard, uh, you know, if a, a friend of mine recently, I was telling her about all this work that I was doing and she reminded me, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So we're not trying to change the world overnight as much as we would like to, but think about the easiest policy change that you could make over the next month. A policy or practice change that might be the hardest to implement is the next question that I have to you. So what's the low hanging fruit? What's the easiest to do? And then what's the hardest to do? And I know that someone has asked to be able to annotate. Um, I, I'm not sure if we can approve that because then that means that some of the comments will be hard to be edited out because they'll be on the screen. Um, but I want to encourage you to drop it into the chat or to take yourself off mute and just share it. The easiest policy to change. What's something you could do this month that could improve how LGBTQ students experience school? Add the pronouns to the name and signature. You can add your pronouns to your name and to your signature. Yeah, right? like on my... Um email and then have the individuals that I supervise follow suit. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I would encourage you to uh, invite them to do that instead of require them to do it. Because I said encourage. Right. You don't know who on your team might be uh, transgender and we don't want to force anyone to be outed. We don't want to out anybody. Uh, so we want to keep in mind that even people that were asking to add their pronouns 
might also not tell us who they are. But it's a great idea. And I, it's one of my best practices that I always ask, encourage people to do. So let's close out. Um, whoops, whoops. In closing, all schools must have non discrimination and bullying prevention policies in place that protect LGBTQ plus students. Bullying can sometimes be seen as discriminatory harassment. We all have federal and local protections that it, that uh, go into school that are extended into school when it comes to our sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Schools play a big role in protecting the rights of LGBTQ plus students at school, and they're responsible for implementing policies and practices that prevent bullying and harassment. And there are school level policies and changes that there that that it exist that advance LGBTQ plus inclusion. And there are lots of resources to help LEAs develop and implement their own supportive practices. So I want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to invite you to ask any additional questions. Make sure that you know about tomorrow's training. That'll be our final of five sessions. Tomorrow, we're going to focus on inclusive curriculum, allyship, and GSAs. So it's going to be a cool, exciting, fun uh, time together. We're going to really dig into some uh, strategies for increasing inclusion at school. And then here's another QR code for you. I mentioned at the beginning that we have a session evaluations. So we're going to send you a, a, a course completion, a certificate of completion if you complete this evaluation. So please, the, the link to it is in the chat and also the QR code can be used to pull up the evaluation. So we're going to pause here, offer up an opportunity for people to ask any additional questions and give you a moment to complete the evaluation uh, so you don't leave that hanging. What other questions do folks have that have we have not answered? Well, it was so wonderful working with you all. I hope that you got something out of it. Maybe I inspired you all to be um, passion, passionate policy advocates like I am, or maybe I just inspired you to make one little bit of change at your own school. I hope, I hope at least that second ha second one happened. Uh, and so when you are done with your evaluation, we are done here. Thank you so much. And you can find OSSI in many different ways. You can send them a letter, you can call them, you can email them, you can find them on Facebook. And can, can we still say Twitter, Nigel? I don't know if we can say Twitter anymore. Uh, YouTube, the World Wide Web and Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> on X. That was not changed in the approved slides. We're all still getting used to it. Change is hard. Does anybody need me to go back to the slide with the evaluation link or QR code? I hope to see everyone tomorrow, 3.30, same bat channel, same bat something, same bat. Showing my age. Same bat channel, same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. You do the same. This was wonderful. Great. I'm so glad. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.